musicians in bars getting beer in the park by the pond getting, what is it? Social. Vodka <laughs> soda. Social, we're getting social distancing. <laughs> in a bottle. In a can. Bottle of can baby with happy hands. Musicians. Like Veronica and Kurt. Um... Oh, well, with Second Pass, which is my hard rock band, yeah. we are uh, Hi, getting... Steve. Hi, Steve. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, we're getting ready to... Uh, we're preparing a song. We have a new song. We're going to record a, a single. Uh, just a single with, with, uh, with a video. There will be a video as well. At the same time, we'll release both. Um, um, it's a song that is kind of transforming into, into almost an ode to the lockdown. And, and some of the craziness that the lockdown has brought out, which includes an enormous amount of social media, an enormous amount of craziness within in, in the social media itself. It's noise. There's too much noise right now. Mm -hmm. Not in the streets, but online. The noise is a cacophony of good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> So that's what the song is about and that's what the video will be about and that's what we're preparing now So hopefully we'll be recording very very soon anything in common with the last video that you did Which one the the, the one with the mannequin that you have a famous video? Oh the, the, the biting my tongue the one that we, we filmed in Bolivia tell us Biting my tongue well it, it, it was what we wanted to do was a video where where we weren't present and we wanted to tell a story um, and uh, this, the decision was to, 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 to film it in Bolivia. Uh, we weren't there, but we got a, a wonderful um, uh, filmmaker in Bolivia, and um, he used a lot, of, a lot of the Bolivian scenery, Bolivian markets, the... Uh, and and, well, in Bolivia, not the video, but the song uh, was, was uh, nominated, I guess, and, and we won as, as the best rock song. Oh, the year and and he that was, as, that was, a, uh, as a filmmaker tell us more about that well it was a neat experience because we weren't there so we did a lot again technology I, I'm all for technology I should add I'm all for technology so it, it, and, and it, the, the idea of being able to film um, you know do a video in Bolivia and, and the back and forth of, of the video itself and, and the storyboards and, and the filming and the locations and all of that was done basically online with us seeing it from from this perspective um, Jesus who was the filmmaker for that for this video for biting my tongue video maybe you're thinking of Ian Pons Jewel so Ian Pons Jewel is an award-winning filmmaker a British filmmaker and he was the one that he he co-directed uh, this video um, with with Jesus. Jesus is one of his prodigies, I guess. Very good. So, so that that's that backstory. And, uh, yeah. How did that all develop? Well, I had seen Ian, Ian moved. It was interesting because Ian Ian moved to Bolivia and started making films there and recording um, uh, music videos in Bolivia uh, for British musicians and. We have a lot of common friends in Bolivia, and that's how that connection happened. And then when we were ready to to, to film a video for for our song, that's when, you know, I thought, hey, Bolivia, I like what they do. I like how the, how how Ian works himself, and he has you know people that he's working with and teaching his craft. And why don't we do this? And Ian unfortunately wasn't available, but then he took his next best man. And um, and that's how that happened as well. <laughs> Do you want to go back in your history autobiographically? That you been into music? Well, I I come. My mother is an opera singer, so I've always been involved in music. Where did she do that? Uh, in Bolivia. Really? Okay. Um, but I focus more in theater when I was younger because it was my sister was the ballet dancer, my mother was the singer, I was the actor. Um, and then in, two, well, 2004, I believe it was, I did a little show, I did a, a, a theater production up in Muskoka, and it was the first time that I sang in front of people, and I did a little 
three second, well, a little bit more than a five second little song uh, in, in, as part of this production uh, as my character. And that led to me all of a sudden getting involved in, in musicals. Oh, great. Um, only as an extra, really. But then seriously singing the first time really was 2005 and 2006 that I got into musicals. I was asked to, to, to perform as in, in musicals. So that was the beginning of singing. Uh, I never saw myself as a singer or actually even as a musician. I, so most people go the other way. They start in music and then they want to be an actor. Right. I, I, I went the other way around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite David Bowie. <laughs> And then singing itself, and then it progressed from there. I went to Bolivia in 2007 with the intention of living there for a couple of years because I wanted uh, my kids to, to see where I grew up, to experience life in Bolivia, which is a very, very different to Canadian life. Absolutely. So by doing that, um, I you know, went to see friends. Many of my friends are, are, are musicians over there because there was always that music connection uh, with my mother. Um, and many of them are jazz musicians. Uh, and then we just jammed one night and... So is this like a Bolivian jazz, like a Latino No, it's, it, no, jazz no, or? it's, it's just, it's, just you know, you're jazz, straight up jazz. Points. Yeah, exactly. very much for, yeah, cool. very much, very much. It's straight up jazz and, and it's just such a, it's such a beautiful community um, mm. of musicians down there. And so I just jammed with him and I sang a couple of songs and then, um, that's where my jazz thing started. Amazing. <laughs> so I that, did. That's in the, the, you're still in the early two, or mid 2000s. By then it was actually 2007. Okay. So I started singing in 2005, <laughs> moved to Bolivia in 2007, and wow. started singing jazz in 2007, Jeez. and discovered something that I didn't know I had, you know, which was singing and yeah. a voice and, yeah. and, you know, being able to improvise and work with phenomenal musicians. Um, that have done this their whole lives and, and all of a sudden I'm, I was thrown into this. It was terrifying, terrifying, but amazing. And so there's still a gap. There's still five years before we kind of met. Yes. So, so I came back yeah. to Canada in 2009 and kind of didn't quite get into the jazz community here. It's a, it's a tough community I'll be honest it's yeah. a tough community to get into yeah, yeah. Um, it's very cliquey and um, very cliquey <laughs> but when I moved back from from Bolivia the, the scene was still very dominated by by the older jazz crowd which is, is standards you know bebop wasn't even something that you would see very often you know in the jazz clubs in Toronto uh, it was more a lot of standards a lot of just the same old stuff to be honest so mm -hmm. so I kind of got out of the scene I decided not to do the jazz thing um, I took a little bit of a break uh, and then I, I, I by pure coincidence I went to an art gallery to see the opening of a friend of mine's uh, exhibit in uh, in the junction <laughs> and there was a guy outside with these little flyers the owner of a restaurant and he said we have a jam a blues jam on the second floor if you guys want to come over after you see your exhibit. It was called cool. Aquila. Yeah. And the Put restaurant back. was on the first floor and the jam was upstairs. So we go there and for the jam to have fun. And that's where I met this amazing blues community, which is uh, yeah. one of them that I'm still in contact with is Dave McManus. Yeah. Wonderful blues community um, and Les Hoffman. And so I started getting into blues. I never sang blues before. It was the first time I um, started jamming with them and then I met more blues musicians or people who wanted to jam blues and that's when I met Steve Pass in the blues community <laughs> in the blues community and he said to me I have this rock band and uh, we have a gig and our singer can't make it would you be interested in filling in and the rest is history. The I came in, history. I jammed with them one time, one night, and, and next thing I know, I'm, you know, I, I'm there. And I've been with them ever since. And that, that would have been... Second Pass. Second Pass. I 
think that was 2013, if I'm not mistaken. So that's right around the time that the Rock Pile East was rolling. Yes, exactly. And we hooked up and uh, had a beer at the strip joint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Your whole band and me at the strip joint. <laughs> and I'm like, so our, what's your story? And you said, I have no story. And so then when did your story develop? When we met at Cherry Cola's, I did not know JC yet. We had met and we became Facebook friends and then yeah. we never ever talked again. And then we had a gig, Second Pass had a gig at the Bovine. And I think we had that gig with JC in, uh, I don't remember his previous band. Savannah. Savannah. And that was when Steve brings JC over and says, you know, this is JC and JC is from Costa Rica and speaks Spanish and I'm from Bolivia, speaks Spanish. So I, 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 that was the connection. I come and meet this, you know, my singers from Bolivia. So then that was the first time I met JC. You weren't in the same band. We were not time. in the same band. Uh, we actually, even though we've been going out for a while, we uh, actually never did music together until oh. a year and a half ago. Where does this start as musicians, <laughs> as a, uh, not, not anything beyond that? So music. So how did that happen? Okay. No, you can, you, let, me, let me do my part, then you can, then you can talk. I'll take it there. from there. So, you know, guys, he's going to jump in. I know. <laughs> so where do, where, when did we start doing music together? We've been around each other for f five years, more than five years. But we started doing music about a year and a half ago. I wanted to get back into jazz blues. So I thought I want to start a band. I want a new band that does that music. Um, and I started recruiting uh, musicians. Um, Kirk's a phenomenal guitarist, and I, I, I knew that it was going to add something really interesting to a blues band because so we don't do standards. Let's see. Um, well, I guess the main reason that I play guitar would be Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. So, Rocky so, Blues, for sure. Yeah, blues yeah. rock, for sure. Yeah, uh, but I, I mean, I would listen to, you know, B.B. Um, King and, you know, a lot of the. It's kind of the old blues guys the as old, well, the uh, but my main my main uh, influences would be kind of rock musicians that really played with a lot of their blues sensibilities, um, such as Zeppelin, which is the main my main sure. influence. And is that cool with you at that point that he was a, from a Zeppelin-y blues? Well, thing? yeah, because what I wanted was an edge. I didn't want the da 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 thing. Right, people you know that I mean? are I, all I blues don't, like I don't, I blues. didn't want that. I wanted someone sure. who could bring something different something edgier and even when we go into something that is more jazzy is having that edge and that that i i, I, I could almost describe it as, as as a melodic harshness that comes into that jazz feel so it, it it's it's really i don't like the word edgy because yeah, it's just yeah. so Overused. you know yeah, yeah it, it, it just it, it brings a sound that is unique. It brings a sound that is very unique because because Kirk doesn't have the, it, 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 it's harsh. It, it's a melodic harshness. <laughs> I think that's the best way and I can describe be, it. Good, good. That, I, that I love. Descriptor. Is there is there a plant page thing going on or a guys, little bit. would you deny that sort of thing? Well, no, I, I've I've brought it, uh, it up before, and there's some, some other people because they're like we have some pictures, and it's uh, fairly reminiscent of. Uh, I, I I I think from a picture perspective, but I I I think from a working perspective, from a musical working perspective, not at all. Mm -hmm. I, I I think that our, our our musical relationship is is it it it, it doesn't fit like that. Huh. It doesn't. It, it's. It's fragmented and it can be hard sometimes. Um, not so black it, and white. It's not so black and white. And it's not like, you know, all of a sudden we were like, you know, you're a musician, I'm a musician. We've done all this, you know, done, we've played gigs, you know, bills together. And one of the most shocking, uh, what is it? Um, one of the most shocking things that a lot of people hear is that we don't do music together. Yeah, I know, we don't really. That we just, just started. I, as I said, a year, a year and a half ago, and even in this quarantine, this whole time, 
you know, we just started jamming together a month ago. <laughs> I know. And we I only know, do it know, once a week. Yeah, know. <laughs> you know, it's not like, you know, wake up and like, oh, let's jam. Not at all. That's a good time not for this interview. Yeah, because this is like this kind really of in the middle. A, this is between. the the one month into your relationship, <laughs> yeah. as far as I'm concerned. The rest of it's all. I don't even know what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never and, mind how you met. Never mind what band. And, and as I said, this I, is I, where it begins a and, month ago. And people think like, you know, oh, Veronica, oh, Kirk, oh, they must like jam every day. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, nope. not at all. Mind you, he was playing while we were talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. It's, so, so as I said, we, we don't have that, you know, it wasn't a magical, like, whoa, look, But look. Now, now it's something to nurture, and do you think you'll be writing this way now? Yeah, we have a new album uh, that we've been working on, for, I guess, for like the last year. Um, oh, like, but yeah. we got the beds done, the drone space and the guitar, the rhythm guitars, yeah. um, before and the pandemic hit. So we're just waiting. We're all actually almost ready to bring keyboards in, organ in the backups, and then Veronica to do it. And my, you know. Souls and, stuff. and this is with the, the Muddy York Blues Machine, which is our ah, our, yeah. our blues our the blues band. That's the name of the, black, of the band. Yeah. Did you mention everything that you've got going, Muddy York? Muddy York and Second Pass really is like okay. from a musical perspective. And, and yeah. Kirk, of course, Reed Effect. Reed Effect and Muddy York and Muddy York. Yeah, yeah. So those are your two, two main things. Muddy York's a good story. Did you name it after the Toronto bar or Toronto? Scene? Well, we, we named it when we were looking for names. I wanted we wanted something that was that was very local because we are all locals yeah. and um, the Muddy York made sense because Toronto was called the Muddy York when it was at its muddiest our music I like to call it I like to think of it as muddy as well because as I said because of that I'm gonna coin that melodic harshness <laughs> because of that melodic harshness um, and uh, when we said blues machine is because we didn't want to we wanted to to give a descriptor that we are not a standard blues band so by saying you know the muddy york blues machine it, it kind of brings the okay we're, we're 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 touching on the roots we're touching on some of the very basic you know blues m melodies but then we're cranking you know yeah, we have our own sound. The, the, the then blues. we're bringing the rock back in. Yeah, we, we have the rock side. Five-piece band, we have keyboards. What's your go-to guitar? Uh, Gibson Les Paul. So, okay. Yeah, for is sure. It, is it a Jimmy Page special? <laughs> no, I wish. Can't quite afford that yet. Similar. One of these days. But yeah, Gibson Les Paul. I have a... Uh, well, I haven't played it for so long. I forgot it. BFG. And I have a Gibson Les Paul special as well. And I put Seymour Duncan pickups in it. One of these and, days we'll get a And Veronica's eyes are glazing over as we talk about gear. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm fascinated by this. Trust me, I am. <laughs> okay. I really am. I don't understand most of it, but... But no, it's funny, I, I really <laughs> don't talk gear. Well, I think I think it's it's for, for the instrumentalists. It's it's such an important for part. Sure. It's almost an extension of themselves. So it's yeah, important and that would to definitely be my... That. Yeah, and, and the, but I bought a Fender uh, Telecaster, like, I guess, three years, two or three years ago. Let's talk more about some of your favorite people. People and places. <laughs> Whose uh, fault was it? It would have been JC, I think. That's JC's fault. It's kind of JC's JC. fault, yeah. So, so she's been uh, yeah. giving J JC a hard time ever since. JC the polar bear. It's your fault. I love him sometimes, and sometimes I'm like, what have you done to me? <laughs> <laughs> God damn it's it, JC. You. This is your fault. <laughs> your fault. But I just remember he was talking about a band like uh, Second Pass that he really liked. So we went out to see them, and then yeah, soon after that we, we were on the same uh, same bill. And I I was so happy with our producer Ted of Dallas. Uh, so I sold the Muddy York Blues Machine. Ted, yeah. So we've been working with him for two years. But anyway, okay. I kind of sold the Muddy York Blues Machine on Ted because I'm, you know, I'm really confident in what he does. He's really good, not just as an engineer, of course, but like as a producer. He has a very strong producer's instinct. Um, so we started, I guess, last fall, I think. I think, so, I think we yeah. laid down drums. And the thing is, Kevin Costa, from the drummer for, from Second Pass, is also the drummer for the Muddy Air Blues Machine. Yeah, so half of Second me. Pass is in this band. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we started, we did uh, pre-production with uh, Ted, yeah, I guess last fall, and then uh, started laying down in all December, the beds. In we December, we recorded the drums in December. 
December? Yeah. Right. Okay. So then March, I finished the rhythm guitars. And then, uh, yeah, then the pandemic hit. So we're just sitting on that. We're really happy with what the, the foundation. It's going to be a good album. Yeah. The it's going to be it's really very, good. It's, very, it's very tight. Good. And, uh, and so, Ted was phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, our keyboardist, Doug, is going to be going in soon. I think this month, actually. Yeah. To lay down uh, organ. That's great. So. We're excited. Anything? It's it's three it's three original songs and uh, and we're doing three um, versions of of somewhat standard songs, but our own versions of them. And one of them is a Black Sabbath song. Actually. Yes, oh, actually, fun. one is yeah. a, Black a Black Sabbath, Sabbath song. But we're, it's very blue, <laughs> our bluesy style. But yeah, three, it's gonna be a six song EP. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, yeah. So, anything else you guys want to talk about that's in your both your in the Muddy York? Yeah, because we have a, <laughs> we have a history, but w when it comes to music, the, the, yeah, well, that we'll history stick, is we'll, more recent. We're, we're, yeah, we'll stick to the music history. Yeah. No, I know, but that's what I mean. There's not. It only goes back like a year and a half. Oh, it's just that. So, so that's what, that's with the Money York, what, what I do want to say with the Money York as well, it, because that has been such an incredible experience, is that we have been able to show our music. I mean, our first gig, real like serious gig, um, as a band and together, was at Hughes Room. So oh. that for us was 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 huge because that was our first actual public gig. The, yeah, the first one was really just for friends and family. Yeah. So, well, that was yeah. The, so that, that was so, at the paddock. But that was more, as I said, it was more. Of, you know, let's try it out. Let's see how how we feel playing together mm -hmm. in front of other people and in, in and front of people. Room, that's a, and, that's then, a, and then and nice then our, our next the we got <laughs> yeah. and then next yeah. the next one was at Hughes Room and we thought uh, we played at the Black Swan. We had a great gig at the Black Swan. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And we audience. played at Relish. That was right. the great gig. place. So, so we, yeah, yeah. we got it. So we've had basically those are four Games. Yeah, for kids. And we We're really, it, it's, it's. But I know you've got some other. Oh, sorry, I didn't mention. No, no, that's. Okay. You, you continue with that. I, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that was a trend. That was kind of the direction we were going, and, and it's exciting. It's very exciting. Um, and then the pandemic hit. So. Yeah. <laughs> Any other favorite people and places like that? Favorite people and places. Well, the rock pile for sure. Um, I, you know, I, Cherry Cola is, is, is also home. Cherry Colas is, is is basically our, at least for me, is my home away from home. And Cherish well, is. You live near there too. I we, yeah, yeah, we're very close. And Cherish is is probably one of my favorite people in the universe as well. Isn't she um, great? Yeah, she's awesome. She's Top she's phenomenal from every perspective, and and she's such a huge supporter of you know the small bands as well, the the you know the up and coming, and, and, and she's just wonderful so yeah cherry colas is, is definitely my one of my favorite favorite places um, to me she's a rock star but she's so understated she never yeah no i know and the place i want the glory no she, she's she's very down to earth you got it that that's just it you know the, the, she doesn't walk around with an ego yeah <laughs> she should i believe that <laughs> because because she really definitely should that. but not just a pioneer for music but for you know, bringing up the girl scene too. Yeah, yeah. she's very supportive of, of the ladies. Yes, and, very and I know awesome. not just you, but, mm -hmm. uh, but so you're tight. Yeah. Oh, I love her. Do you have any cherished stories that you're allowed to tell us? No, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. No. Well, I, I, I for her birthday, we, we second pass, uh, we we prepared um, uh, a Caius song because, you know, just she's tight with them. So. Oh. Well, with 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 um, oh my God, Josh. With Josh, right? Oh, I love that song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we did a Kaya song. We did One Inch Man, because <laughs> that was totally appropriate. <laughs> That's great. Well, we were on the same bill for that too, the Reed Effect. But the other thing is the the Muddy Yard Blues Machine played Cherry Colas as well. We and, did. And uh, Jack White uh, played, I think. Um, it was with the, the Rack and Tours, yeah. And it tours. was it was the it was the after so, party. Yeah, so the after, we the played after the after party. party so yeah. Jack White came back with the yeah. band. So Rock the Muddy York it played. So, yeah, we did a yeah, set. So the Rack and Tours came, played the Sony Center, and then and then he we, came, him he and the band came, came back. Yeah. Well, we knew that he was coming, right? Wow. It was kind of like a Rack and Tours after party. So Cherish booked us. The, the oh wow, that's nice. One of the bands, Queens and Kings, good friends of ours. Did you get to meet? Uh, no, no, he went basically directly right upstairs. To, there was a few people, including the band, that. But there, a couple of guys from the band were, we were in downstairs the chairs for a yeah. while. Oh, great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. 
Uh, but for the Muddy York, uh, just a quick story I want to say sure. before I forget. Like, I was in a cover band of the Romy Coyotes, and uh, the keyboardist for that band, uh, like, he did the first gig with us at the paddock, and then, you know, things didn't work out for whatever reason. But, uh, uh, so it was a four-piece for a while, and then, remember the Waxman and Rebel Hero? Anyway, a good friend of mine, Tyson Froze, he passed away, actually, so, um, but he joined our band for, like, two or three months and he was supposed to do the Hughes Room gig with us and he passed away at like a week oh, maybe a week man, and a half before, before the gig so we were at, we were on the fence as to whether we should do the gig or not we ended up doing the gig as a four piece uh, but it was we had to kind of hustle to kind of uh, revamp like our setup yeah. to, to approach it more from a four piece well good as, for you to stick with it yeah you know, the show must that, go on as they say. yeah the show must go on and then, oh, so of course about, we got. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, so then, a few months after that, we got Doug, uh, Douglas Nolan. On Douglas for, Nolan, and we have Kevin and Ellis in uh, in bass, and he's phenomenal. And he joined like a year ago. Well. Kellis was like, well, Kevin Ellis. I call him yeah. Kellis. Kevin. Because there's two Kevins in the band. We got Kevin Cross. Oh. Uh, so instead of just saying Kevin, we, what what? Kellis. Kevin is, is, Kevin is Kevin phenom and phenom phenomenal bass player, and Doug Nolan is phenomenal uh, keyboard. He joined like a year ago. I and guess. I brought uh, so the two the two first people I asked for the blues band were Kirk and um, and Kevin Costa for the drummer from Second Pass because I love working with Kevin Costa. We did a charity band together. We did a couple of gigs uh, as a charity band. Um, for Awesome Autism was one and a few other charity uh, events. Any other people or places you want to mention? Well, I guess I, I, I should mention Steve Hogue. I mean, come on. He's, he's the one that gave us really a start for Second Pass. So, yeah, uh, people in places. Uh, the Rock Pile. The Rock Pile was, was Second Pass. For us, it was our home, our first home. You know, being a new band, uh, a new band in a, in a rock scene that, that, you know, nobody knew any of us. Yeah. None of us were musicians or you know, involved in the, in the music community, if we want to put it that way. So we were really, really totally unknown. And, and Steve Hogue uh, really gave us a platform and, and we've had, yeah, oh my God, we had, shows. Oh, we had some amazing shows. I mean, even to the point for opening to, for the Misfits, which was one of my favorite bands <laughs> growing up. So That's that was... Great. So it really was phenomenal. But Puddle anyways, of Mud. Yeah. We opened oh, yeah? for Puddle of Mud. Oh, that's great. We opened for um, yeah, you guys Bumblefoot opened. recently. Oh. And we did, uh, well, we opened for Scott Weiland when did his first, um, at the oh, Danforth wow. uh, Music Hall, we were the only opening band oh. when he was here for uh, his, uh, his, uh, his last show? Um, what was it called? I can't even remember. It was Scott Weiland and the Wild oh. Boats. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was that the last tour? It was the... It, no, that was the one first show, and then he did one more after that. Uh, a year uh, later, I think. A year uh, or two yeah. later, and then he passed away. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Wow, some pretty great shows. Uh, May Mayhem Festival was it was the Rockstar Mayhem Festival. So we were here in Toronto at... Um, what did we play? It was uh, the Molson Amphitheater. That time we went to Connecticut. Uh, we played uh, in Hartford, Har Hartford really? Connecticut. We played uh, in New York um, and here in Canada, well, Toronto. I thought there was one more. I don't remember now. But it was it was basically the northern part of the tour. We went with them. And the, the headliners at that time were uh, <coughs> Corn and Avenged Sevenfold. So it was a lot of fun. That's great. Um, and then we traveled. We went to Rocklahoma. With which man is this? That was with Second Pass. That yeah. was two years She's ago. She pointed to me because I drove. I was the driver. He was our oh, driver. Okay. So you're still part of Second yeah. Pass. Well, he, yeah, he became, yeah. I was the photographer too. He I took was, a yeah, lot of gnarly photos pictures. and some some video. And, he, and he, uh, the driver, he, he drove the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> to, it was to Oklahoma, that yeah. was fun. That's wow. Crazy. And then we did uh, Northern Invasion in Wisconsin as well. And wow. that was so a you guys couple have been years around. Ago. We've, we've traveled a bit, yeah. That's great. Musicians in social distancing getting social vodka distancing. soda. <laughs> fried That's a long title. <laughs> Musicians getting vodka. Field strawberry, free edition. And I think when we laugh, they laugh a little bit. Canadians like. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
um, musicians, it's Kirk. <laughs> Kirk Reed, the Reed Effect. Kirk, what's up with you guys? Yeah, so the Reed Effect, um, we're at the end of a, a mix of our new album. Like, So we spent two years on this album. Uh, when we started pre-production, literally two, like June, like over two years, man. We put, I never put so much like money <laughs> and time and energy into this uh, this thing, but it's worth it. And Ted, um, Ted Subdallas is our producer, and uh, the album wouldn't be what it is without him and without his kind of guidance and overlooking the whole thing. Uh, my brother and I, Chris Reed, that's why it's called the Reed Effect. It's uh, a brother. Two Reed, Reed brothers. Two Reed brothers. Um, you know, we we would bring all the ideas in, and then Ted's like, no, we need more of this, we need less of that. Um, so we spent a lot of time. We were very excited. It's all done. I even even heard the mixes for like months now because we were supposed to release the album May first at the Horseshoe. Oh, yeah. um, so we waited May, you know, March, April, and then we had to call it obviously because the pandemic happened. But it was for the timing of the pandemic. I know it's uh, we're very well aware that it's been very detrimental for a lot of people and the economy is struggling and such. But as far as just the read effect, if I could be selfish for a minute, it was, it was kind of the timing of it was somewhat of a blessing because uh, it kind of gave Ted some more time to really mix. And the thing is, I, I'm i a full-time musician. Eh? I teach, I work with kids, and I have cover bands too. I'm always gigging, so it's all music. Um, and I haven't been able to teach. Uh, so he kind of gave me this wiggle room to kind of get a little bit more promotional savvy and uh, to build up my... Um, uh, the social media, so it, like I, I've been able to direct all my energy into this. I think that's very important right now. Yeah. A lot of people should be concentrating on selling their stuff digitally. 